How to truly tackle poverty is a challenge that never seems to go away. Aid plays a vital role in keeping the worst hardships at bay. But how do you bring about lasting change that breaks the cycle of poverty? I'm on a journey to see a different way of bringing that lasting change to the developing world. An approach that's part of the armory of the UK government's Department for International Development and one that's rooted in unleashing people's entrepreneurial spirit, empowering them to stand on their own feet. As a businesswoman whose parents came from the developing world, I want to see if growing the private sector really can make a difference in beating poverty in the long term. If there's one part of the world which forever seems trapped in poverty, it's Africa. For all the goodwill and hundreds of billions of dollars of aid, the UN estimates that around half of Africans live in extreme poverty, surviving on less than $1.25 a day. It's here that my journey began, in Tanzania. It's a country which hasn't been hit by the natural or man-made disasters which have blighted other parts of Africa. Yet here, a third of people live below the poverty line. 30,000 shillings per day. Per day. Per day. Uh, yeah. Is that good? 30,000 shillings? Yeah. There's uh, around... Uh... In the markets of Dar es Salaam, people can unleash their basic entrepreneurial instincts to make a living. But there are some fundamentals which are holding back, not just the locals, but the entire country's development, like electricity supply. You don't have to drive too far out of town to see where the pylons and development stop. I haven't driven very far outside of the city and I've noticed actually that the electricity pylons stop here. So that means that this little village doesn't have electricity. So I'm going to find out how they live without it. Salama. 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 You okay? Do you live here? Uh, this one? All of this is yours. And um, do you have electricity here? Um, no. So how do you live without electricity? This lack of power severely hampers the sort of trade that's possible. Living without electricity is the norm in Tanzania. Only one in seven people have access to power, the very lifeblood of an economy. But I wanted to go and see a project which is trying to change this and headed to Songo Songo, an island about 10 miles off the mainland. The island is home to the vast Songas gas plant, gas which is converted into cheap electricity. Hi, I'm Andrew Hooper, the site manager here on Songo Songo Island. Hi Andrew, I'm Syrah, nice to meet you. You too, Syrah, and welcome to our island. The plant opened in 2004. It already supplies about a third of the entire country's power. As Andrew, the site manager, points out, Tanzania has known about the gas reserves here for decades, but never had the infrastructure to harness it. And they come into a common manifold. The gas was discovered on this island around about the 1960s, but due to gas being uh, the product that it is, um, to commercialise that you need the market, you need the infrastructure to support that, and it's only just recently that we've got to that stage where, where commercialisation of the reserves within this area are profitable. So there's potential, but you need investment? Well, that's right. You need the investment into the industry, and once we get that, we can get the power to the, to the end users, and then they can get the investment into their lives to improve their lives, because they will have the basic uh, requirements for running a business nowadays, such as communications, clean water and refrigeration and all those other things that come with it, that are taken for granted, basically, in most of the other places of the world. Most of the gas gets pumped to a power plant in Dar es Salaam, but some is used to provide power for the locals on Songa Songa, which has spawned a host of cottage industries. 
Just a few hundred metres away from the plant, there's a village, and before Songas arrived, there was no electricity. So I'm just here to find out what impact that's had on the lives of the people that live here. Salam. Salam. Salam, how are you? Fine. Fine. Can I see your fridge freezer, please? Can I have a look? Woo, look at this. Wow, this is your fridge freezer. Yeah. And what is in here? Ice cream. Ice cream? Yes, I am. It's your business. What do you spend your money on? Is this your house? Yeah. You live here? Yeah. Yeah. This is your freezer? Yeah. Wow. Look at this. So you buy the fish uh, and you store it here uh, and then you sell it? Yes. I have a freezer because I have a lot of food. 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 This village has had electricity now for five years and you can already see businesses springing up everywhere. Thank you very much for showing me the site. You're most welcome, It's been sir. a pleasure to meet you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Beyond the ice cream and fish, the supply of electricity is having a real impact on the country's bigger industries. Back in Dar es Salaam, the local cement making firm used to depend on an unreliable supply of diesel. The business has now expanded and in a greener way. Environmentally, it's made a huge impact because it's a much cleaner fuel. And like I said, it's reduced our carbon footprint because we don't have to have cars ferrying fuel to and from the port. So when you have a, a source like Songas, which comes directly by pipeline, it's not dependent on traffic. It's not dependent on getting something out of the port or whatever. It does make it a lot easier and much more reliable in that sense, yeah. The transformational effect of electricity is evident. What's less obvious is the role played by the British government in getting the gas plant off the ground. A key early investor in the gas plant was CDC, an arm of DFID dedicated to growing the private sector in developing countries an approach which has supporters in high places. Aid and, and private investment are, are not substitutes, they're highly complementary. In a country like Tanzania where to, the rate of domestic savings is too low to meet the demand for both public and private forms of investment. Tanzania could be the California of East Africa in terms of an export platform to the Middle East, to Asia, to Southern Europe, but it, it won't be unless it develops its energy sector. Couldn't the private sector have invested in Songas and you would have got the same results? Why did it have to be CDC? Uh, CDC was willing to take a risk in a country whose risk profile years ago uh, was perhaps too high for other potential investors. It's something that's allowed lower costs, wider availability, and, and in that sense, and has has transformed a, a, an abundant natural resource in Tanzania, that is natural gas, into something that's useful for businesses and consumers. So from my point of view, the CDC deserves a lot of congratulations for taking this risk, an informed, calculated risk, but one that was nonetheless a risk, and, make, and helping it become a success. OK, to put all this into context, the support for the gas plant came from a pot of money which CDC has built up over the years and self-sustains. It's not had a penny from the taxpayers since 1995. The plant in Tanzania is one of more than 800 businesses which have been supported by CDC. CDC often places its capital with local investors in developing countries to make their own investment choices. They use that money to help a local business get off the ground, in doing so making it a safer bet for others to then invest in. That business will grow, employ people, pay local taxes, unleash the entrepreneurial spirit and make a lasting difference to areas which have often been stuck in a cycle of poverty. Across the developing world, CDC-backed businesses support the lives of some three million people generating nearly $3 billion paid in local taxes and in 2009 alone encourage further investments of £740 million. 
Africa is one of two core areas for CDC investment. The other is Asia. To the outside world, India seems to be booming, but it's a country of incredible contrast where poverty is rampant. A third of the world's poor, more than 400 million people live in India. If there was anywhere teeming with the possibility of harnessing entrepreneurial drive to overcome poverty, then it's India. Just as electricity supply is a fundamental for growth, so too is transport. In Ujjain, the traditional image of Indian public transport. But thanks to local investors backed by CDC, a new fleet of modern buses has come to town. Buses which are not just comfortable and safe, but run to a timetable and head to the previously cut off parts of the region. If you've got 5,000 people living in a way that's disconnected from markets, then they're just living in the Stone Age. What is absolutely crucial is that connectivity. And then suddenly you see all kinds of opportunities because wages are low at such places. Entrepreneurs think of running a business where they'll produce something there and take it back. Ideas start flowing when you have connectivity of people, of telecommunications networks. So it's, it's a really transformative thing that you have a place which is cut off and then the first roads come along, the first mobile companies come along, the first internet connectivity comes along and within a few years the place is completely transformed. In Mumbai, a city of stunning contrasts, what's holding many people from grabbing the economic opportunities around them is a chronic skill shortage. It's a pressing issue for the local member of parliament. In my constituency in particular, I can tell you that there are many jobs, many openings. It's just the right manpower that's missing. So you have an educated workforce but they perhaps lack the necessary skills that can allow them to get employed. And that's something I've been working on. Mumbai is really a very sort of dense and concentrated manifestation of what's happening around the country. Dharmendra is one of the millions of Mumbai's underskilled. His father's been working as a tailor all his life, but doesn't want his son to go into the family business. He has higher hopes for the 20-year-old. He uh, never allowed us for this job because uh, there is too much of struggle in it. And uh, that's why he never helped us, uh, never allowed us to help him over in his work. Yeah. There's a growing recognition that the toil of traditional skills is unlikely to move the family on from their current situation, where all six family members eat and sleep in two rooms. Having dropped out of education, Demendra is hungry to learn again, this time something vocational. Demendra has received a bursary to attend India Skills, where he's taught the art of retailing in the classroom and in a simulated store. Retail is one of the areas lacking enough skilled workers. 
From last three months, I am uh, studying with the India Skills. Uh, it is a course which helps us uh, in understanding the, about the retail industries. It's about the retail management. At least we can predict that what uh, what are the customer needs and what we can give them. The MP is supportive of India Skills Ethos, an Indian company providing a solution to homegrown challenges. And I think it's something that's very exciting. It's gone down very well with people who've benefited from it so far. And it's a matter of prestige within their own homes and within their own communities. So it's worked out very successfully and we're very excited about it. Now you should also understand how to handle customers. Key to getting India Skills up and running was early investment from CDC, which came via a local fund, IDFC. When you look at the opportunity in infrastructure in India, it was huge. And while a lot of loans are available by the banking sector to pay for the debt required for these projects, the risk capital required is in short supply. And that's where investors like CDC globally came together to put money into our business, which we would then go and find and analyze opportunities in India and see where can we change people's lives. Your session is in town, right? In future, I'm thinking of becoming an MBA and having a big post, like a good post in the retail industries. There should be my name somewhere and people should know me. That's me. Solving something as intractable as poverty needs all the creative thinking that can be mustered. Across the developing world, I've seen a model, spearheaded by Britain, which is deploying a different approach to making a lasting difference, giving people the same tools that we have ourselves to change their own lives. There is an old notion of external assistance, that there are poor people in India who are leading a terrible time, children who don't get vaccinations, children who don't get school, and can a donor organization roll up their sleeves and chip in and try to run some direct mass action programs so that more children would get vaccinated? And at some level, that's great. I mean, that's surely a moral thing to do. It makes us feel good when 100 more children are vaccinated. I want to humbly say that India is a country of 1.2 billion people. Half the children in India suffer from malnutrition. And relative to the size of development budgets that may be found anywhere in the world, that's just a drop in the ocean. It's just too little to matter. A far better use of external assistance, a far better role that any well-wisher of India can play is to help us de-bottleneck the economy. Our goal shouldn't be to vaccinate 100,000 more people, but our goal should be to understand why is it that the local system is not doing this by itself and injecting that capital where it makes a difference.